Praise the Lord, Saints. This is a Pastor Moultrie, Assistant Pastor of Cokesbury First Baptist Church in Port Deposit, Maryland. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, trusting that God is keeping you, not only you, but your loved ones, as we pray for your families and your loved ones daily. And we also just want to uh, make acknowledgement right now that this is uh, Pastoral Month, so our pastor will be taking a rest, must need a rest in the month of June. Right now he's in North Carolina and also went to Georgia to spend some time with family members. Um, we trust that he'll be back safely either by Tuesday or Wednesday. So continue to keep him in your prayers. And, and also we just want to uh, take time out right now and let you know if any of the members of the Cokesbury family, if there's a need that you have, please do not hesitate uh, to contact and let us know how we can be of service to you. We love you, you're part of the family, and we're here to minister and to serve you, amen? So without prolonging any time, we want to be able to, uh, to be committed to what we say we would do. We're doing a study, actually, in the book of Ephesians. Uh, for the month of June, we started last week, we looked at uh, position, uh, possession, and praise. And we specifically looked at the spiritual gifts and we want to continue to, uh, to to investigate to see what great things God has designed for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we'd like to do today, we're going to look more intently at those uh, spiritual gifts that God has given the church as, as we ask the Lord bless our time. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, what I encourage you to do is that uh, open your Bibles with us and take out a paper and pen. And take some notes down because what I believe that as you receive um, the feeding from the man of God as we share in God's word that a lot of what you will retain and, and be able to digest is also what the Holy Spirit will show you personally. So so do that. And also as, as, as I promised that after each preaching session that I will hand out uh, a handout uh, to use somewhat as a study guide as you take your notes to keep uh, the study with us as we continue uh, to labor and dwell in the Word of God together as a family. Amen. If you did not receive a handout, please let me know. I will make sure uh, that I email it to your attention expediently. So with all heads bowed, let's go before the Lord. We want to ask the Lord. This is an extraordinary book as I stated last week. Looking forward to, to uh, sharing with you uh, fellowship and worship. We know that we're restricted, but nevertheless, God is still faithful. The building might be shut down to a certain degree. The doors of the church is always open. God's church is still functioning and operating. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this time that you have given us, Lord. And I pray, Father, that your man, that I, Lord, that I would uh, decrease, that we would hear from you. And that, Father, that you will give us understanding of your uh, blessed word. We ask these things for Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. Last week, what we looked at, we looked at the spiritual gifts, and of course, what we shared. But the spiritual gifts was dynamic uh, as God was showing these things in, in possessions and in the position that we have as believers that's needed for the church of Jesus Christ today. And the theme of Ephesians, as we said, was the operation and the function of the church. Otherwise, the blueprint of the church. And, and, and one of the things we did, we wanted we, we focused specifically on verses four to fourteen that explains the gifts. And, and one of the things we shared that the gifts we, they were blessings because God bless us. And we say that when God blesses us, He changes our status. We're not the same, and we're able to do things. Uh, that we could never do in the natural man. And he has incorporated us, uh, invited us, and chose us into his family. And the other thing that we say about the spiritual blessings is that um, not only were, were they spiritual in a sense, but it was through the working of the Holy Spirit. When you look at the word blessings and the fact that they're spiritual, the word spiritual means that through the outpouring and the work of the Holy Spirit that he commenced, he that he communicates and he dispenses those gifts to every believer. If you save, you receive not only the spiritual gifts, but you receive these spiritual blessings, so to say. And Paul begins to expound and explain more in details what those blessings are in verses 4 to 14. We had the opportunity to read, hopefully, that you ran over your notes. 
you had the opportunity to read the book of Ephesians in its entirety so we can get a good feel to what God wants to show us. Now, one of the things I did not go over last week was this, was the word heavenly. He says, the God, now Paul says that God has blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And there's something about that word heavenly places because the word heavenly places, it, it, it focused on not just heaven, and that's probably the primary thought that, that comes to our mind, is that he's speaking about heaven. Heaven's included, but heavenly places, he's, he's actually addressing the, 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 the supernatural realm. It is the place and the domain that God operates. But it's not only that, but it, it's the place that where the supernatural, it, to me, it's actually the real world. Uh, what goes on behind the scenes that you cannot see with the naked eye. The natural man, he, has, he, he does not have access to understand what happens in the supernatural. We do because we're in Christ. And that's one of the blessings when God has chosen us and adopted us to be sons, uh, the children of God through Jesus Christ, is that we have access now into the supernatural uh, realm, the spirit realm. And matter of fact, he mentioned it several times because in Ephesians 1, 20, it tells us that God has raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, and now he sits with him on the right hand in the heavenly places. But it's not only that, because also in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6, not only does Jesus Christ dwell in the heavenlies, because we're in Christ, we dwell in the heavenlies too, because Ephesians 2, 6 said that because of the very fact that God has raised us from the dead into a newness of life, now we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he also mentions this in chapter 3 of verses 15, this, this terminology, the heavenlies or the heavenly places. But also, it's also a place where we can't see with the neck and eye, where there's spiritual confrontation between good and evil. And he speaks about that in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12. So these blessings that we have, they allow us to function. Now what does that mean? That means that, that we have dual citizenship. See, even though we're here on earth as believers, because now we're connected to Jesus Christ, our citizenship based on Philippians, now we have a primary citizenship in heaven. And we're just strangers now. Sojourn is here on earth. We operate in the heavenlies because we have a connection. We can do great and mighty things because of not only the spiritual blessing, but also because of the spiritual gifts that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's a word, spiritual. He gives us tools that we can function in the supernatural realm and do things for the expansion of his kingdom that we cannot do through the natural body and through the flesh. That's important. I wanted to make sure I, I point that out about the heavenlies. Now, what does that mean? How, how do I really understand it? Well, because of this pandemic circumstances that we find ourselves in, uh, many of us had the opportunity to, to work at home. I know I do. And even uh, before this pandemic, several years ago, I stayed home for work because I served as a caretaker for my wife when she was ill. And we have this program that I'm sure that you're well familiar with. It's called TeamViewer. And what TeamViewer does, it allows me to see the computer that I have on my job. Now, I work 50 miles from here, but because of TeamViewer, I can function as if I'm at the office and I can do my drawings, I can do my blueprints, I can run my calculations, I can go to any of my files, even though I'm here at 390 Oxford Avenue. Otherwise, what I'm saying is that physically, I can be seated at 390 Oxford Avenue, but I can function and operate as if I was present at 130 West 25th Street in West Baltimore, 50 miles away. That's how it is with the child of God, is that be, though we're here in the flesh, physically on earth, because of our citizenship in heaven, God gave us, first of all, spiritual blessings that we can function in the heavenlies while being active here on earth. That's how we have victory. That, that's why we, we praise God and we thank Him for the great things He has done because now we can do great and mighty things. Not only the spiritual blessings, but the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts allows us to serve God and, and, and to do things, to serve one another uh, because and to operate 
and do supernatural things that we cannot do in the flesh. Now, now, quick, quick point I just want to make is that we said that the gifts was dispensed by all three members, all three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We said that the, uh, the Father himself, uh, I, I used the metaphor that the Father was like a chief architectural engineer, and the Lord Jesus Christ is like the field engineer or the application engineer or the general contractor who came to the site through the work of redemption, and he put into action the very plan that the Father thought of before the foundation of the world. And the Holy Spirit, he's like the facility maintenance engineer because when Jesus went back to be with his Father, what the Holy Spirit did was that he came as the comforter and he maintains operation of the church. Jesus is still the head, but the church operates in function because of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the gifts, he gives us the communication, he empowers us, he gives us discernment, amen? Uh, matter of fact, let me read this. See, the Father, he has the plan of redemption. He, he, he has the blueprint. It's based on his sovereign will. Remember that? When you look at the spiritual blessing, it is, it's, it's based on the will of the Father, the work of redemption of the Son, and the witness and the testimony of our inheritance through the Spirit. The father is like the chief engineer. Hebrews chapter 11, 10 speaks about Abraham. And it said that Abraham, for he looked for a city which had foundations, who builders is God. Now, now can I, I, I want to read another translation. This is a New American Standard translation. And it says, for he was looking, that's Abraham. He was looking for the city which had foundations, watch this, whose architect and builder is God. See, God the Father is the architect, and he designed uh, the plan of redemption to restore sinful man back to himself so that man can live out the original objective why God created him in the first place. The Lord Jesus Christ, remember the field engineer, he came to the job site. In John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. That's John 6, 38. And the Holy Spirit, that when Jesus went back to the Father, he said he would not leave us comfortless. He told us in John chapter 14, he told us in John chapter 16. But in John chapter 14 specifically, he says this, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. See what the Holy Spirit does? He maintains the function and the operation to keep the church moving. And, and it's something I shared when I was preaching and that I heard a long time ago, and it stuck with me, and I shared it with the Cokesbury family. And what I share is that the church of the living God is not a warehouse, but it's a factory. It's a factory because it's always things that's being produced. Always uh, an action in motion. A warehouse is just a storage place where there's dead activity. There's nothing in production. It's just a storage place. But the Church of the Living God is a factory. Disciples are being made. Gifts are being used. Relationships are being healed. Disciples are being trained to go out to do evangelism and also the body is being built. Up. There's always something happening that falls under the counsel of the will of the Father. That's the uniqueness of the dynamic of the church. Now, why are we learning this? Well, one of the reasons why I felt there was imperative that we do this because uh, one of, in my personal belief, and it's true actually, and the Bible says so as well, is that in the latter times, especially in the Western society, I believe that the church has somehow lost its sense of identity, but also the church has lost its power. And I had, to, I had to state that very carefully because I'm not indicating or saying that God has lost his power because he hasn't. The same God who has the ability to take the sinner and to transform him to the newness of life, he didn't lose his power. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone believe it, to the Greek, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. 
But there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, for it's written that just to live by faith. Not only that, God still has the power to keep those who are saved, saved. So from the foot of the cross, when we receive Christ, till we get the glory, God has keeping power. That power, he can't lose. God can't lose anything because he's perfect and he's holy. We said that last week. There's nothing that we can do to change his status. Amen? So Peter says this. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5, For we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, which is ready to reveal in the last time. But what I'm saying is the church of the living God somehow has lost her influence. Why? There's an identity crisis. The church collectively, don't forget, Ephesians is not just for the personal believer. The book of Ephesians is relegated to the church in general as a corporate involvement as well as an individual application. But the church has somehow lost the direction of the original blueprint. It can be for different reasons. Sometimes it can be for a lack of teaching. Or, in personal wise, can be a lack of devotion to Bible study and prayer. And what happens is that we can be sidetracked. Or maybe it's the case like Matthew's chapter 13. Remember the parable of the soul and the seed? Jesus said, a soul for the soul. And some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls in the air came and devoured them up. And some seeds fell among the stony ground where there's no deepness of earth. And when it sprung up, it was scorched by the sun because there was no deepness in the withered away, but some fell among the thorns. And when Jesus said, the seeds that fell among the thorns, they, they, it was choked because of the thorns. And he compared that, even though I believe that Matthew 13, primarily at first, is talk about salvation, but it can also be applied to the Christian life. The cares of the world, the thorns choke the fruitfulness of the word because of the cares of the world. The different reasons why we get sidetracked where the church can lose its identity. It's important. You know why? The point that I was trying to make last Sunday was that we need to understand our position, our possession, our identity. Because first point application was right doctrine should bring about a right doxology. That means that we give thanks and praise to God. But also here's point number two. Right doctrine should also bring about right behavior. So let's get into our study because what I wanted to do, um, something a little bit different. We're going to stay. I'm not leaving the text and I'm not leaving this theme, but we're going to look at chapter four and then we're going to work our way back to chapter one. Two things I want you to focus on today as we bring today's message. Spiritual blessings that we promise in Christ Jesus, but also the hope of your calling. I want you to think Honestly, what is the relationship of the hope of your calling and the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus? Now, I'm going to give you time, hopefully, that you have your Bibles with you. Phone, tab, laptop, whatever. Please, open up the Bible so we can read this together. This is chapter 4. And then we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 17. And then we're going to start looking at uh, four, uh, verses 4 to 14 in chapter 1. This is uh, the King James Version. Actually, excuse me. This is actually the New American Standard Version. Ephesians chapter 4, Saints, verse 1. Just want to look at that one verse, verse 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, I, prisoner of the Lord, implore you that you walk worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Can, can, can I repeat that again? What Paul is saying, watch what Paul is saying. He says, I therefore, or therefore I, prisoner of the Lord, implore you that you walk worthy of the calling which you have been called. Picture that. Don't, don't lose that thought now. You're calling. Time out. That's a sidebar. You know what I like about chapter 4, verse 1? Paul says that he's a prisoner of the Lord. Now, if you know anything about the background of Ephesians, we said last week this is a prison epistle. And Paul was uh, uh, under house arrest when he was in Rome. What happened, Paul was falsely accused by the Jews of bringing in a Gentile into the inner sanctuary of the temple and defiling it, something he didn't do. 
But you notice that Paul didn't say, I, Paul, prisoner of Rome, victim of society, brought forth from facts, false, false accusations. He said, no, I, Paul, prisoner of the Lord. This is just a sidebar. What Paul was saying is that when you have a genuine intimacy with Jesus Christ, because you're bound to him, that you will not allow your circumstances that you face every day to hold you and be bound to hold you up and imprison you. Because of Jesus, he said, because I have Christ, what he's saying, because I have Christ and I'm bound to him, I'm not bound to my circumstances. I just thought I'd throw that in there, a little golden nugget we can focus on. And, and I love that because that's something that we have to apply daily because, because we face hardship in life every day. Matter of fact, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, he said, if a man live to see long, uh, a lengthy years, let him rejoice in the years, but remind him there'll be some dark days and those days will be many. That's just par for the course. Okay, now let's get back to the calling. The word that we want to look at this morning is the word worthy. It's the Greek word axios. Axios, A-X-I-O-S, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And then what that word implies, uh, uh, it, it means uh, deserving or it could mean uh, 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 equal values, almost as if you had a scale, that you have a certain weight of something, that you have something that this opposite of that certain weight that has the same value. Picture a scale or a balance. And it was a saying that whatever value you have on one side of the scale, you have an equal value on the opposite side of the scale. That's what that word worthy means. And what Paul was saying He's saying that uh, my behavior in Christ, the real me, and, and how I function, not only in church, but in my private life, how I behave based on chapters 4, 5, and 6 should be reflective of my positions and my privilege, who I say I am, in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Otherwise, what Paul is saying is this. Paul says that my lifestyle should match up to my privilege or that my behavior should be equal to my belief. If I'm saved that I'm saved, matter of fact, otherwise what he's saying, if we say that God is our daddy, if he's Abba, that's what, that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 16, he says the spirit bears witness, not to our spirit, but the spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God. And he says God is our daddy. Act like it. Matter of fact, my dad used to tell me this. My dad said, when you go out on these streets, he said, not only do you look like me, you're my namesake. You got the same name I have because I'm a junior. He said, when you go out on these streets, he said, act like you had some home training because whatever you do reflects on the name of me and your mama. That's what he said. Matter of fact, and he flipped the script on me. i never forget when I was 17, he says, have I done anything in your life where you will be ashamed of me because how I conducted myself towards your mother, towards you and the family, and the community? Did I come home blasted? Did I come home cheating on my wife? He said, did I do anything that you should be ashamed of me as a father? That thing hit me, man, when he said that. <laughs> so God is telling us that, that the life that Paul is saying our calling, remember we're focusing on the word calling. He said, based on our calling, that we should live out, based on what he commands us to in chapters 4, 5, and 6, what God has blessed us with, all the good things and the attributes of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, can we adjourn to chapter 1, verse 17? Amen. If I want to look at verse 17, we went over this uh, last week. And, 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 I, and, I, and I thought that verse was so instrumental because after Paul starts describing about the blessing, why we praise God and worship him and adore him, the psalmist says, bless the Lord, all my soul, all that's within me, bless his holy name. It's because God has given us all these spiritual blessings and then he began to expound what these blessings are. Now, we did this last week, but I just wanted to indicate, because remember, spiritual blessings, your calling. And what Paul says is, he says, he said, I do not cease to, I'm going to start at verse 16. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father in glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom 
and revelation and the knowledge of him. I think the King James Version said that he might grant you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and knowledge of him. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, I love that. <laughs> I don't know, something about that line. That God keeps giving me insight about that each day of my life. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, that you will know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches, the glory, the inheritance of the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power. Now, I want to focus today, this day, on Sunday, we're going to focus on that we may know the hope of our calling. See, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, we ought to walk worthy of the vacation where we're called. But he says here in chapter 1, he said, I'm praying that God will give you insight and knowledge of your heart. Your heart is the very seed of wisdom, understanding, and insight of how to live life every day. He says, I pray that God will give you uh, insight of the hope of your calling. He said, well, why would he ask for that? He just got finished explaining from verses 4 to 14 what the hope of the calling is. Because once again, right doctrine should bring about right behavior. God wants to make sure that, and, and as always seemed to be my cliche, God wants to make sure, but he does. He wants us as believers to what we have. I can, can, sometimes it sounds like I might be redundant, but I, I got to say this again, is that the point of this lesson plan for the next, for last week and this week and the next coming weeks that the Lord tarries, is that not to just get an academic exercise of some theological terms, is how can I be effective in my personal life with victory and power based on who I am, knowing my identity, knowing my positions, knowing my possessions, and today, how does that affect the hope of my calling? That's what he's saying. The hope of my calling, that, that, that's an important dynamic that we have within the church. And the first thing that we shared last week, so now let's go to you know, the hope of our calling, because the hope of the calling, Paul actually breaks it down what that hope is. Based on what, Pastor Bill? Based on the spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. I want to read something. Let's go back to verse 4. We did some of this last week. The first thing, we, we talked about God the Father and through his sovereign will is that he has dispensed the spiritual blessings that highlight the things that he has already done in the past. The Lord Jesus Christ, he manifests and shows those gifts that applies to us that's happening right now, even as we speak, the present. That's called the work of redemption. And then we have the Holy Spirit in verses 13 and 14, is that he bears witness, but he's a bear witness too. He's our down payment, that God makes good on his promise. He's the God's promissory new. He's our down, the, the Bible and the King James Version use the word earnest, that word earnest, we'll get to that. But the word earnest means that he is our down payment of future inheritance to come, amen? So, so when we looked at the word chosen, can we read that again? He said, verse 4, now once again I'm reading out uh, of, of, the, of the New American Standard. Uh, he says, just as he has chosen before the foundation of the world, that we'll be holy and blameless before him in love. Now this is the part that I want to share, that, we, that when God chose us, and we said that based on God being self-existing, his choosing was not only for himself, but by himself. No outside influence. And before I go any further, when I say that God chose for himself, because God's plan of redemption is for one thing and one thing only. It ain't about us, saints. It's for his glory. Not mine, not yours, not the church. I mean, he used us to be to the praise of his glory, but is, can we say it again? His glory. Let me show you. In verse 6, I just want to intercede with that. He's verse 6, he says, to the praise of his grace or his glory, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, right? I think your King James Version said that we were made accepted in the beloved according to the praise of his glory. And then if you look at verse 12, he says, once again, he says, to the end that we who were the first in hope in Christ and will be to the praise of his glory. And in verse 14, he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance and I think that's what you have in the King James Version speaking about the role of the Holy Spirit that he is the earnest 
of our inheritance. Uh, to view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. See, God's purpose of his plan, even as when the Bible talks about that all things, creation, mankind, creation, will be reconciled back into God under the authority of Jesus Christ, is to God be the glory. Just wanted to share that. So when he chose us, and, and I'm point, I, know, I want to point out, I want to point this out as well too, and I know that our time is short, but that when God uh, uh, give us these blessings, he not only chose us, one of the blessings, that he chose us before the foundation of the world, but also there's a purpose of why he chose us. You see, he not only chose us before the foundation of the world, but he chose us to be holy. The Bible said he chose us to be holy and blameless before him in love. There's a purpose that God chose us, you see? And, and, and even though that we're not perfect, and, and, and sometimes I, I know that's the thing that we like to use as a, uh, I wouldn't call it an addendum, that we're not perfect. We know that. You know what? As a, as a preacher, I don't have to keep saying that we know we're not perfect because you already know that you're not perfect. You live with yourself every day, and I know I'm not perfect. But I want to find out how we have victory. He says that positionally, watch this, key word, positionally, we are holy and without blame. You might have a hard time understanding that because we face it, we know ourselves every day. But if you're in Christ and you have received saving faith, and you are the recipient of his saving grace. He says, not only did he choose you, but he chose you with a purpose. And he chose to be holy and without blame. That's a gift that he gave to us. That's his spiritual blessing that he given to us. That happened before the foundation of the world. He predestined, watch this. He also predestinated us into the adoptions of son through Jesus Christ and to himself according to the, uh, the good pleasure of his will. Uh, I'm kind of interchanged between New American because in my mind I memorize <laughs> the King James Version. But what he's saying is this, is that these are the things that God has done. What did he do for us? Well, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Uh, he also predestinated us that we would be made the adoption of children through Jesus Christ in him. Amen. And then he also he made us accepted and beloved. Those are the things that happened in the past. See, what God did, and your, what defines, now, now, now we're going to use the calling. What defines the hope of our calling is, number one, that God wants you to understand that you didn't choose him. He chose you. Why you say that, Pastor Bill? John 6, 44, Jesus says, No man cometh to the Son, lest the Father draws him. John 6, 37, Jesus says, all that the Father give to me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I shall no wise cast him out. So be, and the blessing is, the hope of your calling is first based on what took place before the foundation of the world. God chose you in spite of you. That's what I want to look at. Not because of me, but in spite of me, he chose me before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless without blame positionally that's who we are also he predestinated us the bible says into the adoption of sons and the, and the, and the difference that I, that I love about this is that that you have parents they 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 went in this they are to be commended when they adopt somebody and, and the child who they adopt they carry the same benefits and the same rights as a biological child. But you know what the difference is? The difference is that when God adopts somebody, not only do we receive the benefits because we're joining us with Christ, right? But also we bear his image. We look just like him. That's why Paul says in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which is an awesome Christ Jesus. Because you know why it's important to understand that? Because when you go on that job, and you face that ball boss who gets on your nerves and then God wants to remind you of your identity, your dual citizenship because, you know why? Because that boss might not know Jesus and the closest thing that he sees to Jesus Christ is you. His perception of who he thinks Jesus is is based on you. How he sees you function within the work environment. Amen. And not only that, that he adopted us Bible says that we are made accepted in the blood because of the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, that, that God made us accepted, that we have access to call him daddy 
only because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we said earlier, it's because of Jesus Christ that we see it in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6. This is some good stuff, man, because, I mean, I'm sure the stuff that you read a thousand times, but we got to understand our identity. Church cannot move forward without power till we go back to the blueprint and we function based on our privilege and not only individually to walk worthy of our walk worthy of the vacation which we're called, but as a church, Cokesbury, as a church, God wants to take us to higher heights and deeper depths. But it starts at the basic, it starts at the blueprint. And then, then we look at the work that the uh, that the son did, right? And the son is the work of redemption. Now what he says, um, verse seven. Let's go to verse seven. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. You see that word redemption? That, that, that's, that's a powerful thing about it, redemption. Well, the word redemption, what that implies that, uh, of a debt that's being paid or, or, or being counseled or ransom that's being paid. And, uh, and the whole scenario from the Old Testament, even to the New, is that a debt's being paid to bring freedom to somebody who was in the slave market. Amen? And with the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that 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 we were slave to sin, that we belong, that we was in the bondage, and we were the uh, Satan's puppets. And with the and with the blood of Jesus Christ, that He said, "It's through His blood we had redemption. Uh, we had redemption uh, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, and God forgave us, right? Because of the blood, and and and, and what He did, He emancipated us and freed us." from the slavery of sin. But it just didn't stop there. There's two, now I wanna take my time with this because there's two dynamics to redemption. The first part he says that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, right? He forgives us, but also God gives us the tools that we don't know, that we no longer have to walk in sin. Watch it, because not only did he, he says, which he has lavished, or I think the word that you have in King James, that he abounded on us, all wisdom and insight. What he's saying is that God gave us the tools, how to function, that we no longer have to be a servant to sin or slave to sin because he freed us through the shedding of his blood. There's a movie that my wife and I love, uh, Morgan Freeman film. You know, Morgan Freeman is always famous for his narrative, uh, 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 it's a good storyteller. It's a Shawshank Redemption, and and for the sake of time, what was centered around was that there was a, a a business accountant who was falsely accused of murdering his wife, which he didn't do that, but he didn't go through that. Wasn't a county jail. He was sentenced to life uh, for a federal penitentiary, and, and uh, so he meets um, some friends who've been in there for a while, and the story narrates about his involvement. Uh, where they join this close friendship as they incarcerated. Now, let me get to my point. My point was not so much the main character, Andy Dufresne, I think his name was, but it was a Morgan Freeman character. It was another gentleman who was a senior citizen. At separate times, Morgan Freeman and this other gentleman, they went up for the parole board uh, to be granted discharge. And at, at some point in time, they finally, they were granted parole. They spent the majority of their life incarcerated. The dilemma was that once they got out to the free world, was they, they did not know how to function in freedom. I wish I had somebody. Can I say that again? See, when they got out, they were so used to being institutionalized that when they were discharged as free civilians, they could not function as being free. They still tried to conduct their life as if they were still incarcerated. The older gentleman, unfortunately, he was so beside himself, he couldn't handle it that he hung himself and took his own life. And Morgan Freeman was going to do the same thing as well. Man, in fact, Morgan Freeman was working at the supermarket and he thought he was still institutionalized. He had he kept raising his hand and asking his boss or his supervisor, uh, can he take a bathroom break? Can he go to the bathroom? The guy said, Yeah, you can go to the bathroom anytime you want. You're not you're not locked up anymore. The point that I'm making is this. You free, who the son has set free, is free indeed. What Satan wants you to believe, he wants you to live your life as if you still a servant to sin. He wants you to think that you got a problem 
functioning in freedom. God says you're free. See, one of the dilemmas that didn't show in the movie, and I believe it might have been, was that they didn't show that these two individuals who was granted discharge, that they prepared them how to function as a civilian when they became free. See, God didn't do that. God not only freed us from sin and the penalty of sin, he freed us from the from 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 the uh, demonic embracing of Satan. But watch this: He forgave us of our sins, and His forgiving is not just a small forgiving. He gave us He forgave us according to the riches of His grace. That's what you say in King James verse. And what He's saying, He forgave us to the point, and He this is not licensed to sin. My sins will never exceed the riches of his grace. That's the first aspect. And God wants to make sure that I walk in victory. So what he did in verse 8 is that the word I'm using, this translation, use the word lavish. It means shower. He showers us with wisdom and insight. Why is that important? Because God has given you and God has given me the necessary tools that we know how to fun that we that we can function in freedom. Because we're no longer bound. Matter of fact, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. He says, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has set you free, not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And he also says in the same chapter in verse 13, he said, God calls us to liberty. So now that God gave us the tools, watch this now. If God gave us the tools, then that means don't use my liberty for the occasion of the flesh. So what he says in verse 13, Galatians 5. But to love and to serve one another. I know my time is running out, but also in 1 Peter, oh, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter joins in and let you know, see, because I don't know who's fighting this and dealing with and battling this stuff with having victory in your, in your Christian life right now. Maybe this is for you today. But Peter says that according to his divine power, God's divine power, he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness according to the knowledge of him who called us the glory and virtue. Amen? That, that's what Peter said. That's, that's what God has given us. Amen? And that he has given us everything to pertain to life and godliness according to the knowledge of him who called us the glory and virtue. You want to know what that looks like? Romans chapter 12 verse 9 15 says that our actions speaks that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. This is Romans chapter, real quickly, Romans chapter 12 verses 9. You want to turn it real quickly. He says, let love be without dissimulation. or whore which is evil, plead to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honoring, preferring one another, not slowful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patience in tribulation, continuing in instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that do weep. What I just explained to you, that's the picture of someone who's walking in freedom. Because when you walk in freedom, you have spiritual influence and power because you know who you belong to and you know what you possess. Not only did God calls us as individual saints to walk in this freedom, God is speaking to the church. God is speaking to Cokesbury. Somebody had a book, it was an author, and the book was based on, or, or an article based on what would Jesus say about your church? Cokesbury, what would Jesus say about our church. What kind of church are we? And I'm not doing no witch hunt. This is something that, that we can collectively and pray for that 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 we live out power and, 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 and to fulfill the dynamic that God has for our local assemblies with the other churches because we're all in this together. We're all in this together for the work of the kingdom. And I know my time is running out. We, we'll probably uh, stop right around here. Uh, didn't get a chance to talk about the third component. But just, but just remember, the hope of your calling is defined by what God has done through us through the spiritual blessings. 
And Paul says, I pray that he will grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of our heart might be enlightened to understand this week the hope of our calling. And as God's saints begin to give us understanding of this hope that we have, let us walk worthy. Let us walk worthy of the vacation where we are called. Amen. Remember I said at the very beginning that the church of the living God, the church of the living God is not a warehouse, but it's a factory. This is where we're in, and I'm done. What does a factory look like? You know what a factory looks like? A factory looks like Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13. Paul says, till we all come together in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, measuring up to the fullness of the statue of Christ. And before then, he talks about all the corporate gifts that God gives in terms of the apostles and the prophets and, 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 and the pastors, teachers, and the evangelists for the perfection of the saints for the work of the ministry. What I just share, Ephesians chapter 4, 13, that's what a factory from heaven looks like. Let's continue to press on. Let God continue to encourage you. Don't let a pandemic stop the work of the church. You're doing a bang-up job. Pastor talk about you guys all the way, man. We get bang-up jobs and teaching, bang-up jobs and ministering to the saints. Let's go out and win some for Jesus. Now, with all that being said, maybe there's somebody today, I would be remiss if I didn't share this. You don't have a relationship. And I just want to share something out of John chapter 5. Jesus has the power to save those who are dead in trespasses and sin. And, and Jesus says, Rarely, rarely, I say unto you, John 5, he said, The hour has come, and now it is where the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And he said, And those that hear shall live. Maybe you heard, and the Spirit of God is talking to you right now. If God is speaking to you, my question to you, are you listening? If God is telling you that you need salvation, are you listening? If God is telling you that you need to commit your life to Jesus Christ and trust in him, nothing else, not so much, not, not church membership, not being religious on the outside, trust him to save your soul from your sins and to spare you from the place that's called hell. The hour has come and now it is where the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those that hear shall live. If you're listening right now, you can give your life to Christ. You'll live. How will you live? You'll have eternal life, and you'll spend eternity with Him. Commit your life to Jesus Christ. And if you don't know how, it's something we do as a prayer, but it, once again, I just want to emphasize, it, it's not so much the prayer, but it's the condition of your heart, because Paul says that with the mouth, confession is made but with the heart men believe into righteousness I just ask Christ to come in and he said Father I heard the message I, I believe the testimony of your son the Lord Jesus that he died for my sins and was my substitute of a punishment that I deserve because I'm a sinner and I want to confess my sins right now Lord I receive you as Lord and Savior and I ask forgiveness of my sins I ask you Lord Jesus to come into my heart and save me change me Lord and I'll follow you all the days of my life. Now, if you said that prayer, if you thought that, or you want somebody to talk to, I want you to let somebody know. And what I did last week, I'm going to do the same thing this week. I'm the assistant pastor. And what I want to do, I'm going to give you my cell number right here, 443-807-6868. I do want to add this, and I was thinking about this this past week. If you are a female and you prayed that prayer, then I want you to do, I want you to text me and with your permission, I will send that text to one of the woman leaders in our church because I believe the men deal with the men and the women deal with the women. Because here at Coke Spirit, we want to make sure we do everything in decency and in order. With all, with all that being said, may God bless you, saints of God, friends and family. Be safe out there, but take the presence of God with you. May God bless you. Bless you. And have a smile upon you.